in this video, we're going to be tackling the leak code question, Pascal's triangle. So if you have taken high school math, I guarantee you that you have seen this triangle before. Pascal's triangle is just a triangle of numbers, but you have to admit something about this triangle, the order, or just the way it looks is oddly satisfying. And this is because of a few unique mathematical properties. If you look at the leftmost layer of this triangle, you will notice something peculiar. All of the numbers are ones, and this goes for the left side as well as the right side. Even more peculiarly, you will notice at the second layer, the numbers increment just as you would do if you are counting. These are counting numbers. But where things start to get really crazy is when we start talking about the rows and not the diagonals. If you sum each row, each row is equal to the powers of two. But if you don't sum the rows, each row by themselves are equal to the exponents of 11. And before computers and before calculators, this had to be pretty groundbreaking. But how exactly do we create this algorithm? Given what we've learned about Pascal's triangle, we know that the leftmost and rightmost diagonals are all going to be ones. So with this in mind, we already know that the first two rows are going to be all ones, and each successive row is going to have a one to the leftmost block and a one at the rightmost block. After that, for these individual middle elements, what we can do is we can sum the top two elements above it and add it to the element below, and we can repeat this process as we go down the pyramid. But given that there's no actual triangular data structure besides maybe a tree, how exactly are we going to build this? What we're going to do is we're going to use a nested array to build Pascal's triangle. And this is going to be by far the most intuitive and also yield the highest time complexity. So here's how this is going to work. The first thing that we are going to be given is we're going to be given a variable that's going to represent the number of rows that we need to create. Since we know the number of rows and we also know that the leftmost diagonal of the triangle and the rightmost diagonal of the triangle need to be ones, we can quickly create a for loop that will create all of the rows for us and populate them with ones, just like I have done right here. So now we have the actual structure of our pyramid built. And what we're going to do is we're going to iterate back through our series of arrays. And when we do this, we can skip the first two elements because any changes that are going to be made are going to be made after these first two elements. And what we'll do is we'll go up an array and over one element, and that will give us the element to the left. And we'll do the same thing, but we'll move to the right. So we will sum these two numbers, and this will equal two. Then we'll continue to iterate down, and we'll do this exact same thing. We'll go up one array element, we'll get the element to the left, we'll get the element to the right, that will equal three, and then we'll do the exact same thing. We'll add the two, we'll add the one, that will give us three, and congratulations, we have just made Pascal's triangle. So let's go ahead, let's hop into IntelliJ, and let's code it up. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a brand new Java class, and we're going to call this solution. Within the solution, we will go ahead and begin creating our method. We're going to return a list of lists, essentially a nested array. I'm going to go ahead and import this class. The name of the method is going to be generate, and we're going to take in 
an integer that's going to be called num rows. Since we are returning a list of list, a nested array, let's just go ahead and create the data structure that's going to hold everything for us. Now keep in mind, this data structure is not for the individual rows. This is just pretty much to hold everything. Then what we're gonna do, obviously we're working on an algorithm, so we're gonna have to do some type of iteration. Let's just go ahead and create our for loop. Once again, the AI is getting a little crazy here. It's getting a little out of bounds. What we want to do is we want to set our I to zero, and we also want to say if I is less than the number of rows. We do not want less than or equal to. The I++ looks okay. And what we're going to do is once we're inside this for loop, we're going to go ahead and we're going to create another list but this one's actually going to contain each individual row of the pyramid. Instead of just being a box like the previous list of lists we just created. So once we're inside of this for loop and created our row data structure, now what we need to do is we need to create the for loop that's going to create all of the ones like we did on the whiteboard. And the way that we're going to do that is let's just go ahead, use the AI again, but we're going to have to change a couple more things. We're going to say if J is less than or equal to I. It basically means instead of iterating over every single row, this is what's going to iterate over every single element. And we're just going to add one for everything just so that we have a pyramid that we can work with. So the next part of the algorithm is arguably the most important. We're going to set a for loop that's going to skip the first element. So we're going to set int j is equal to one. Then we're going to set the logic so that j is less than i. And the reason that we're going to do that is so that we also skip the last element because both of those should always be one. Now what we need to do is once we get to the third row, we need to start grabbing elements above and to the left, above to the right, adding them so that we can get the number below, just like we did with the two. There's many ways to do this, but I'm just going to destructure all this out so that we can understand how things are working a little bit better. So first thing, I'm going to use the whole entire array, and this is what's going to grab above, and this is what's going to grab to the left. We want to the left here. And once we get done with this one, what we can do is we can go ahead and grab the value above and to the right. And AI is going a little bit crazy here. Again, I don't know what's going on with AI today, but we're going to do the exact same thing. But instead of J minus one, we're just going to set J and that's going to be the right. Then we're going to sum them. So we'll just add the two variables that we created. And then you guessed it, we're going to set them where we are at in J, where we are at in the individual array we are iterating through. And finally, last but not least, we add the row and we return the list of lists that we have just created, that we have just added to. So let's go ahead, let's grab all this right here and I'm going to go ahead, exit out of full screen mode and we're going to go ahead and test this code. So let's go ahead, let's bring over leak code. I'm going to paste this into here and I'm going to run my test, make sure everything is passing, everything is accepted. Let's go ahead, hit the submit button. Let's analyze the time complexity. You have attempted to analyze the time complexity too soon. So leak code will start erroring if you try to analyze the time complexity too much, but this time complexity is going to be quadratic and also, the space complexity is likely going to be quadratic as well, too. Depending on who you ask, leak code will say that it doesn't depend on input or output, but in my opinion, it's still uh, quadratic space complexity, although some people may argue it's actually constant. So it's whatever you want to believe. I think it's quadratic. Anyways, hope that you guys enjoyed this. If you did, smash that like button, smash that subscribe button, and as always, thank you for watching.